And in cities, about 70% of the carbon that's generated in a city, it's from buildings. So the energy it takes to heat and cool buildings. We said, listen, we have got right now, we're primarily fed by big cogeneration plants in the big urban uh, cores. But although it's green and it's the greenest way to use, okay, say, fossil fuel, natural gas, large scale, it's not good enough. So we really need to make the next step to decarbonize. Hello and welcome to the Pumps and Systems Podcast. Today, we're going to be speaking with Bill DeCroce, President and Chief Executive Officer of Vicinity Energy. He's going to tell us all about the role heat pumps can play in decarbonization, as well as the efforts cities like Boston are currently making to strive for sustainability and an eventual goal of net zero carbon emissions. So without any further ado, let's get into the episode. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on the Pumps and Systems Podcast. So uh, before we get started, would you mind telling us a little about yourself, you know, your role, your background, anything you'd like our viewers and listeners to know? Sure, sure. So uh, my name is Bill DeCroce. I'm the uh, chairman and chief executive officer of Vicinity Energy. I've been in the energy business in and around for 40 years. Started off training guys how to run submarine reactors and then went into commercial nuclear for a long time and did most jobs at a nuke plant. After about 20 years in nuclear, I transitioned to call it thermal energy, um, district energy um, with a couple of different flavors. Mm-hmm. So um, started off running the uh, uh, unregulated subsidiaries of the biggest utility in New England. And then I moved over to work for a French company, Veolia, when they uh, first were aggregating a portfolio of district energy businesses. So I sold them their first business in 2005, and then we grew that to where it is today as North America's largest portfolio of district energy companies. And I I can talk a little bit about what that means. District energy has been around for a long time. It's going to be around for a long time. It serves urban cores and campuses. So everything from downtowns like Boston, New York, Philly, and many cities across the country to uh, hospital complexes, university complexes, military bases. So anywhere where you aggregate thermal load, in other words, lots of buildings, it's typically a district energy system there with a central plant uh, that has pipes underground connecting buildings that are either flowing hot water, steam, or cold water to condition buildings. So we operate in 12 cities in uh, the United States, everything east of the Mississippi. And that with about 22 systems in those 12 cities. And it comes in a couple of flavors, a big urban core systems like Boston, Philly, and Baltimore. Those are a big three. And then down to, in some cases, smaller redevelopment mixed use sites like in Atlanta and D.C. Um, most of our business is urban cores. So where we heat and cool urban cores, the buildings in urban cores. Uh, But in some cases, it's these campuses. And uh, one of the campuses is a big university, West Virginia University. So a mix of uh, of different applications of district energy. So today we're going to be talking about uh, decarbonization, sustainability, and the role that pumps can have in that, correct? Sure. Absolutely. All right. So then why don't we start by talking about uh, low temperature heat pump system. So can you tell us a little more about those pumps and how they work and what impact they can have. So if you don't mind, can I just lead off with a bit on decarbonization? Go for it. Yeah. Why? Why we're heading in this direction? Yeah. So as as we all know, um, you know, climate change is a huge issue worldwide. And there's various sources of it, um, industrial, uh, transportation, and then there's buildings. And in cities, about 70% of the carbon that's generated in a city uh, which are very energy dense uh, locations, it's from buildings. So the energy it takes to heat and cool buildings. So as a district energy company that focuses on heating and cooling urban cores, um, you know, about three years, well, probably four years ago now, we said, listen, we have got right now, we're primarily fed by big cogeneration plants in the big urban uh, cores. But although it's green, and it's the greenest way to use, okay, say, fossil fuel, natural gas, large scale, very efficiently heat and cool uh, cities. It's not good enough. Mm-hmm. So we really need to make the next step to decarbonize. And we realize that um, 
because we have these power plants and these urban cores, we're connected to the transmission system, the electric grid. So today we push power out from our big cogen plants, and then we take the heat, the waste heat, and heat to the cities with it. We thought about this and said, wait a minute, what if we reverse the flow, because we're already connected to the grid at the transmission level with big substations, which our power plants use, uh, we can pull in renewable power, convert it to um, steam or hot water or chilled water, and all of a sudden, and, and use a lot less methane and eventually zero, and decarbonize huge swaths of urban core. So I'll give you an example. Like in a place like Boston or Philly, we heat in each city around 75 million square feet. That's a lot. Yeah. If you look at the tallest building in Boston, it's around a million square feet. So in a place like Boston, that's a skyscraper, uh, we heat the equivalent of 70 of those. So it's a big footprint. And we can rapidly and cost effectively decarbonize. So that's kind of the story behind where we're going. Then we said, well, how are we going to do this? So phase one was to say um, existing tech, well proven, and can and is at industrial scales, huge electric boilers. So the first one's going in in Boston. It's arriving next week. And so I, I we'll have customers. We'll work with them. We'll we'll buy renewable power. And we'll convert it in that electric boiler to steam. And if and the customer doesn't have to do a thing to their building. So no conversion costs. Zero. They're already connected to us. We do it back at our plant, which has been the beauty of district energy. Because as we've evolved over time, most of our plants 80 years ago started as coal fed. Then they went to oil. Then they went to gas. Then they went to cogen. So now in this next transformation, we swap fuels again to renewable power. And the building's just receive the same thermal energy they always got. We just do the conversion differently. So anyway, first step was electric boilers. But then we looked at this and said that they converted 100% efficiency. So all the electricity that goes in comes out the other end of steam. There's no stack like in a boiler. You don't lose any energy. It's 100% conversion. So that's not good enough. So obviously, the, the, the tech out there that is greater than 100% efficiency are heat pumps. Because what they do is if, you know, just real briefly, I know a lot of our audience knows this, but just for the sake of it, they <clears throat> move energy from one place to another. So like your AC in the summer, it takes energy from inside of your house and dumps it outside. Heat pump can go both ways. So in the winter, it'll steal energy from the air and put it in your house. So heat pumps move energy around and, and they harvest energy from somewhere that's free, whether it's the atmosphere or groundwater. So the next step, what we looked at is, and this technology has been developed in Europe, is industrial scale heat pumps that harvest energy from rivers and oceans. So in our case, Boston, Philly, our two biggest systems, today our cogens sit on the Charles River in Boston and the Schuylkill River in Philly. And we used to use that water, in some cases still do for cooling. So we would take river water and use it for cooling and go back to the river warmer. In the future, we will install these massive heat pump complexes. We'll take energy from the river, or water from the river, send it back colder, we'll cool the river down. We'll extract the energy with these monstrous heat pump complexes and make steam with it at 200 plus percent efficiency. Because for every unit of energy we put into the heat pump to run the big pumps and compressors, we harvest more units than that from the river. So effectively, you're you know, 200 plus percent which is good for our customers because that means for the same amount of thermal energy that they would get into their building, they have to buy half as much electricity. So it's, it's even more economical for our customers and ultimately um, increases or, or, or increases the, uh, the rate at which we use less fossil fuels. So, because the more energy we make with renewable power in our, in, in our electric boilers or heat pumps, the less methane we burn. And eventually will convert over, you know, the, our, our entire load to, to heat pumps as base load. So they'll run 8760 year round, 24 seven, and then we'll use electric boilers for peaking. So winter peaks, uh, interday peaks, things like that. What's interesting about this technology, and we've worked with a company called Man. what they provided were huge compressors. So at the end of an oil or gas field's life, um, it's harder to extract the product. So what they would, they had these big compressors, house-sized monsters that would 
uh, pressurize the well and force out the product. Well, in, in, with their foresight, and, and I have to say the Europeans have uh, been a little faster to the game than us on this side of the pond, uh, they said, you know, what's the future? So if you look at what's at the heart of a refrigeration cycle or a heat pump, they're compressors. So when you look at your AC unit outside, you've got your little, little compressor out there, which is key to a refrigeration cycle. I said, wait a minute, we've got these monstrous compressors that are used in oil and gas. Can't we make monstrous heat pumps? That's what they did. They started at 8 megawatt units, 10 megawatt units. They're now up to 100 megawatt units. So these are big machines, um, you know, uh, bigger than a house when you look at the whole complex. Uh, they're, they're, they're large. So in our case, we're sitting on a river. We've aggregated in Boston or Philly 70 million square feet of thermal load. So you're the perfect case to plop in one of these monster heat pumps, extract water from the river and cool it down, which the environmental groups love because typically industrials are heating up rivers. And frankly, as the planet warms, the river heats up, which the critters that live in, in the river don't fundamentally appreciate or they're not used to right. so we're actually helping the river cooling it down so it's a win-win key part that i already mentioned we're leveraging existing infrastructure so that's really when you look at the heart of these uh industrial heat pump complexes and even big electric boilers i mean you're moving fluids around so what do you need huge pumps what else do you need huge compressors so it's it's and it's all you know kind of in thermal energy that's the business you're moving fluids around and transferring energy from one place to another so core to the technology are are uh, are pumps and compressors yeah so is there anything standing in the way of this technology getting more widespread use in different locations there's different environmental policy at play so for example in boston uh like many other very progressive cities have enacted legislation that said buildings need to reduce your carbon. So, for example, Boston enacted a law. They started about 10 years ago saying buildings, you got to learn how to count your carbon. And then a couple of years ago, they said, all right, now that you know how to count, you got to reduce. So they basically put a kind of a, a, a miles per gallon, if you will, or carbon per square foot sticker on a building. And there's 12 classes of buildings that they you know, uh, describe because buildings are different. Hospital is different than a commercial building. It's different than a stadium or a bio lab. So there's 12 groups of buildings. And they said for each of these, you get your carbon per square foot and it has to lower over time. So building owners are saying, all right, I, I got to meet the new policy. Also, you've got institutional goals. So we've got customers that are big multinational, for example, in Cambridge and Boston, big multinational pharmaceutical companies. They've got big laboratories, research, process. And uh, their owners, beyond what the, the law is in Boston, just have institutional goals, say, we're getting net zero fast. So between policy drivers and institutional goals of companies, they're coming to us and saying, how do we get to zero fast? Universities as well. Remember, universities have a whole bunch of young people called students who are worried about their planet. Mm -hmm. And students are starting to demand it. When they're looking at schools to go to school and their parents are figuring out how they're going to spend their money to go to those schools, um, they're looking at the carbon footprint of the school and what's the school's plan? What's the university's plan? So there's a lot of drivers out there that are getting getting buildings to say, we got to move. And if you look at our situation, we can go really fast. The buildings don't have to do a thing. We change our technology at our plants to convert Instead of fossil to thermal, we go renewable power to thermal. They don't do a thing and their carbon drops. So the way it works is a, build, a building will come to us or a, or a group of buildings, like a, a, say a life science campus. They'll say, we, we, we look at their loads over a year and they say, we want to reduce our carbon by X. Some of them are saying, take it to zero. Mm. And we, we write a contract with them to buy X amount of what we call e-steam. What we'll do is we'll make that amount of steam for them in that given year from renewable resources. And we'll work with them because many companies already have well-established, big companies have well-established programs to buy renewables, buy renewable energy credits. So they know how to do it. They've always done it. They've done it for electricity. And now they can do it for thermal. 
because we're just going to buy you know they were buying electricity for their buildings now they can buy electricity to send to us and we convert the thermal form so it's a pretty slick way for buildings to cost effectively reduce carbon their alternative is to try to electrify their own building so today if they're running on us or they've got gas boilers say to heat their building the building's designed around hydronic systems they want to go to heat pumps in the building it's major surgery very expensive and then they have to buy retail power which is not necessarily cheap on our hand they don't have to do anything in their building we do it at our plant and we're buying right off the transmission backbone so we're buying wholesale power and we give them a share of the benefit of that so it's a very cost effective solution for for particularly at scale you know we're talking urban scale to rapidly reduce carbon. And we've got a lot of support uh, from cities like Boston, uh, which has been great. Um, and we're working closely with uh, states like Pennsylvania and Massachusetts and Maryland, because Maryland has enacted some new pretty, pretty progressive laws around decarb. Uh, we're also working hand in hand with the big utilities, the uh, big public utilities. So for example, uh, Eversource, which is the largest utility in the Northeast, um, they recently announced they have, they have a grid modernization program to try to figure out how to electrify and, and how to receive the wind from offshore wind sources and basically how we're going to modernize the grid to deal with this. And we've been working really closely with them. Um, and in their recent study they put out, they said, we need to take advantage of these district energy systems like us. <clears throat> because in order for them to electrify those 70 million square feet that we serve, they need a bunch more substations. And then they've got to electrify the buildings that aren't on our system. Mm -hmm. So they need more substations. And if you know anything about putting substations in cities, it's hard, it takes a long time, and it's really expensive. Whereas we just tell them, hey, we want to buy a whole bunch of power for you. And uh, <clears throat> instead of buying gas, we're buying power. And it becomes a pretty slick tool for the big electric utility to get a, a head start on electrification by using us. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of a, you know, it's kind of a, a, a nexus of win-wins. It's a win for the customer. It's a win for the environment. It's a win for the, for, for us and the big electric utilities. It's an interesting time, a, tr a transformation again of district energy. So what do you think the future of district energy looks like or how soon do you think we can reach that future? So it's very bright. I mean, because now we found the path to rapidly decarbonizing urban cores with district energy and it, take it to my, I say urban cores, but then you just look at the campuses I mentioned too. Look at any university that's got a district energy system or a hospital complex or a military base or a stadium. They might not be in an urban core, but since they have the, they're already connected in some form or fashion to the grid, they can convert. And if they're near water, this heat pump technology is going to, is going to take off, this industrial scale heat pump technology. Because that one, I, I guess I should say that the new part of this, of the new, these new heat pumps is in the past, conventional heat pumps could lift temperature about 50 to 80 degrees. So for example, if it's 30 degrees outside in the winter, they could raise the temperature, say, 50 to 80 degrees. That's enough to heat a house. That's not enough to make steam. These new industrial complexes, because they're multi-stage, can lift 250 degrees, so you can make steam with them. That's, that's the big change. So for these big urban core systems, the scale, and the, uh, um, the scale of the energy conversion and the quality of the energy coming out the other end, so it's much more energy-dense product, put it that way, has made it possible. Okay, so having said that, I think the future is very bright for district energy as a decarbonizer in, in, in cores and, and on campuses. And as far as how fast can we get there? So I already mentioned the first big 50 megawatt boiler is going in in Boston now. It arrived, it was supposed to arrive yesterday. Uh, the truck got delayed. <laughs> These are, it's big, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's not a quick process, but it, it'll show up next week. That will be in service. Our first customer is taking e-steam in the fall. It's a, it's a brand new 4 million square foot life science lab up by Fenway Park in Boston. The heat pump complex, we're actually kicking off the project to get our plant ready. So what we'll do is we'll, we have uh, some old, older uh, big natural gas boilers 
we're going to retire one of them and remove it. Uh, we're starting now. Uh, so we'll, actually, it was, this, it, was, it was yesterday, and now it's throttle up on the heat pump. Let's go. So we're going to start demolition. And we need to do a couple of other modifications to plant to be ready for the heat pump. And we're working closely uh, with man to finalize our design of, of heat pump number one for Boston. And we expect it will be in service. Uh, I would, I'm hoping for two years, you know, it might be two to three, but in that time range, we'll be up and running and that heat pump will run baseload. So it will be 24, seven, 365 harvesting energy from the Charles river. And we'll be heating Boston and Cambridge with it. We can move fast. I think the next place will land one and probably sh shortly following Boston. And by shortly, I mean, maybe six months to a year behind is Philly. Same thing. Now, the, the political environment, the policy environment is different there, but we've got big institutional players, um, universities and hospitals that, you know, regardless of the policy, they want to get to zero. Before we wrap things up, do you have any other thoughts or insights you'd like to share with us or anything else you haven't touched on that you'd like to? The, the reason why I'm so pleased uh, to you know get involved in, in um, events like this today is the word's still not out there necessarily. And as we've done, and we're trying to do a better job to get the word out on what we're capable of doing, how fast and how far we can go, uh, it's helped it not only to educate the building owners, but the architect engineers mm -hmm. who build buildings. Because if you get in the process too late and they've already designed the building, it's hard to turn around. So we've been, you know, trying to get the word out, not only to our customers and the local governments, but also just to the community that's around building and modifying buildings. And and that's accelerated uh, pretty dramatically in the last couple of years. So, um, you know, I would I would offer up that any of your listeners, if they want to know more, you know, please go to our website. You know, we have white papers out there to describe what we're doing. We certainly will answer any and all questions if you reach out through the website because we're more than happy to talk to people about what we're doing and what the possibilities are, because we, we expect that this will spread from Boston to Baltimore to Philly. And then Grand Rapids is quite interested. Kansas city starting to show interest. I mean, and what I mean by not net, sometimes the city, so the city government, but also just uh, players in the city. So building owners in the city, Will, it will drive a transformation, a decarbonization transformation that can move fast. So that's what I would encourage. Talk about us, ask questions, reach out to us, and we'll be glad to uh, help to inform. I mean, I definitely knew nothing about this topic before today, so you've educated me as well. So thank you for yeah, that. Excellent. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. I know I'm sure you have a busy schedule, so we appreciate that you were able to squeeze us in. Right. No, no, my, my pleasure. My pleasure. Very happy to do it. Huge thanks to Bill DeCroce for taking the time to speak with us today about the role heat pumps can play in decarbonization efforts. If you're listening to the podcast and would like to watch it instead, hop on over to the Pumps and Systems YouTube page to see the full video version. That's going to do it for today. Thank you so much for listening or watching, and we will see you next time.